And we are live. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, of course, today we are discussing, as promised, gender stereotypes and everything surrounding uh, the stereotypes on gender in society today. Uh, we are joined by a phenomenal panel of, of amazing people doing amazing things all over the continent. We, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Robert Burale, the presence of Cabello Chabalala, the presence of Patience, Iri Bagiza, Rachel Mwikali, and Hilaut. I will be joined by a co-moderator, her name is Michelle, but without uh, spending too much time on introductions, I want us to jump straight in. I will ask Robert to introduce himself. Tell us a bit about what you do in a few seconds, and then we'll move onwards to Cabello. So, Robert. Well, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor to be here with you. I don't take it for granted. Well, I am an uh, inspirational speaker. I'm a corporate trainer, an author. I'm the founder of The Naked Truth and the Robert Brothers School of Leadership. But above all, I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Robert. Cabello Chabalala. Everyone, my name is Cabello Chabalala from South Africa. I'm a columnist, the founder of the Young Men Movement, an organization of boys to ensure that we have a better race boys that subsequently are going to be better men and in the future. And yeah, that's what I do. Thank you so much, Cabello. Over to you, Patience Iribagiza. Patience. Um, I'm Patience Iribagiza. I'm from Rwanda. I'm the executive director and founder of a non-government organization called AfroArc, and we work on women empowerment and as well as GBV and uh, uh, socioeconomic empowerment generally among the youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, patients. Hila, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, introduce myself. So I'm a gender and youth advisor at Care International Ethiopia. Uh, basically, my job is uh, ensuring uh, mainstreaming of gender across programs, both development and uh, humanitarian, uh, supporting capacity building, um, uh, and also like evaluation monitoring, uh, extra overall program cycle, uh, gender mainstreaming. Yeah, thank you. Nice, nice to meet you all. Thank you so much, Shilawit. And last but not least, before I let my co-moderator introduce herself, Rachel Mwikali, tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Mwikali. I'm a proud and apologetically African feminist uh, based in Wadare Informal Settlements. I am a co-founder and convener of Coalition for Grassroots Human Rights Defenders Kenya. It's a social movement of grassroots activists, feminist activists, and community organizers. I'm passionate about gender justice. That's why I'm here. And being also that is 16 days of activism. So I'm looking forward for the conversation. And now we can sort of contribute in one or another to ensure like... Uh... Thank you so much, Rachel. And I want to introduce Michelle. Michelle will be helping me carry out this discussion for the few minutes that we will be on with you in preparation, of course, for today's evening concert where we have lined up an array of artists to have an interesting showcase of music and poetry and dance centered around educating us on the issues surrounding gender and the stereotypes that come from it. So Michelle, yes. please take us away. Thank you so much, uh, my co-moderator Robin. And thank you all for being so patient with us as we sorted out our back end issues. We truly appreciate your being gracious with us as we went through that. So very quickly today, I will introduce our subject of the day, which is gender stereotypes. I think also in the interest of time, you will forgive me for not getting into the individual um, profiles of all our speakers. However, we will invite them 
to tell us a little more about what they do and how that connects to the work around gender. So very quickly, before we get into the main part of this you know, conversation, I'll invite all of you in no particular order to quickly tell us about your work and how it connects to gender work. So I'll start with um, Patience Iribagiza. Dr. Patience, welcome. Can you tell us a little about what you do and how your work connects with gender work? Welcome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, as I've said, it's a great pleasure to be here. I guess you can all hear me well. Um, as I've said before, I'm the executive director and founder of uh, an Indian government organization called AfroArc. It's a young women-led organization, and we do work in different sectors, uh, including sexual and reproductive health rights and services, women empowerment, uh, uh, governance, and as well as nutrition. So through women empowerment, it's all that we strive for gender equality. So uh, I would say maybe one of the programs that we have already on the ground and mostly in villages, because that's where the people who are still influenced by culture. Uh, we have a program called Uruwahi Relief Program, where young women, mostly teenage mothers and most vulnerable women, come together to share their stories uh, mostly on SRHR and gender-based violence and how to uh, resolve conflicts in, in their homes. So uh, through that program, we've been able to harmonize, I would say, gender stereotypes, mostly uh, trying to uh, talk to wives and husbands uh, in person and how they're going to, uh, on how they identify their roles at home uh, based on their genders. If it's a wife, you have to be uh, doing cleanliness at home, taking care of the family, and the, the husband forgets that it's also one of uh, his responsibilities besides looking for money. So uh, we've also been engaging young boys as well so that we can nurture a good, a young generation uh, for tomorrow that will be able to have that equity uh, to achieve the equality. So uh, briefly, I would say, um, since it's a young women-led organization, all that we've been doing, all that we've been doing as, is, uh, is that we made it a young women-led organization because it was one of the, it's one of the most vulnerable population, if I may say, women and girls concerning this gender equality, equality or inequality. So we made it a young women led so that we can at least have a way of advancing women and girls in general, so that we can at least at some point we'll be having that equality. Uh, maybe I would say that's what we do in summary. And maybe if there will rise any other question, I'll be gladly to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Great con uh, contribution. And I really do appreciate uh, how your work really comes through in this fight for gender equality. Uh, thank you so much. And very quickly, we will now move on to Cabello. Cabello, kindly tell us a little about what you do and how it connects to gender work. Cabello. Thank you very much. Um, we started the Young Men Movement about five years ago. And looking through the village where I come from, I realized that there are quite a lot of issues regarding the boy child, that we are in a society that is more focused on the victims and not doing much about the perpetrators or potential perpetrators, which will be boys and men in this regard. So then we took it upon ourselves to say that we need to get to a space where we also look into the life of the boy, boy child. What are the things that are contributing towards the negativity of his masculinity? What are the things that are making them grow up to be hard men that only emote anger and nothing else? So that is how we get into the gender issues to think that for us to have um, a society that has more progressive men and women, we need to start focusing on the boy child. We need to so that 
we give him the necessary tools to ensure that he also becomes better, to ensure that he, he, he also looks into his life and understands the dynamics, that it's not about raising boys and men that will respect women and girls, but about raising men and boys that will respect human beings in general. So our aim is to raise better men, better boys, who will fit into a society that is is ideal who will also contribute towards us fighting patriarchy us fighting misogyny sexism and any other form of things that we do not and truly you cannot discuss uh, gender gender work without including men and so that is very And thank you for, for telling us a little more. I hope we didn't get cut off. In case we did, my apologies for that. My Wi Fi is um, misbehaving. I was inviting Hilowitz to join in the conversation by telling us a little more about what she does and its impact on this conversation around gender. Hello, it. Yeah, okay. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, my role is basically at ad uh, advising programs and projects uh, on mainstreaming of gender and youth empowerment and women empowerment. Uh, so basically what I do is gender. <laughs> so uh, but like as an organization, if I'm not sure if, I, if you are aware of about uh, care, uh, but what care does, uh, whatever mainly the program areas are for security, um, SRH, um, and uh, like humanitarian response, uh, and also um, pastoral community development in pastoral community and resilience. So. Around the sectors, um, the objective of my role is ensuring um, integration of gender, uh, women empowerment, and youth empowerment. Um, uh, what we do to do that, and what my role is in order to ensure mainstreaming of gender and youth empowerment, is uh, working on social norms. So uh, the strategy we use is engaging community to discuss about the social barriers like gender and social norm barriers uh, using different tools that allow them to create a community discussion a community dialogue so um, we bring together communities both norm holders and uh, like communities like women men boys and girls and norm holders like rule makers, lawmakers, um, religious leaders, community leaders. So by engaging this group of people, we identify norms that are more relevant to the objective we are trying to achieve in the project. For instance, if it's an SRH project, we're going to identify who are the norm holders in relation to uh, women reproductive health. Uh, in this case, it can be, you know, uh, mother-in-laws. It can be religious leaders. While in the food security sector, it can be government programs. We have like a PSNP program that's a huge program working on resilience, a government program. So whomever is a stakeholder in that sector, we going to identify them as the norm holders. And we work with the community to identify whatever norm is that's prohibiting women involvement, women participation, uh, and main, uh, you know, uh, norm, main uh, discussion, main participation in gender equality and youth empowerment. And we will hold on a, an ongoing community discussion. Uh, that's one of the most successful approach we use to uh, address gender equality. When it comes to gender-based violence, uh, we work mainly on protection and response. Uh, and identifying, you know, pathways in the community because the implementation in operational areas we work on is really broad, basically half of the country. So we identify pathways, uh, we disseminate those, and also we make sure existing protection mechanisms are strengthened by the government and the community. Yeah, in short, this is what uh, my role is in gender and gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting us know. 
And I know this is taking a bit more time than we had anticipated, but it's very important to also understand the different contexts to better understand how our contributions to this conversation uh, impact the different contexts that we come from. So very quickly, we'll now go to Rachel Mikali. Hi, Rachel. Hi, am yes. I audible enough? Yes, you are yeah. very audible. Can you tell us about <laughs> your work and how it connects to gender work? So like, like uh, the way I'd say it, it's not my work, it's our work as Coalition for Grassroots Human Rights Defenders, Kenya. And um, we are based, the way I said, in Madari Informal Settlement, which is the largest informal settlement. But as a, our movement is more into even other grassroots community and informal settlements. So ideally, being a movement, our leadership is more on a feminist-led uh, movement with feminist value, feminist approach, and human rights approach. And uh, the fact that Kenya is also patriarchal and uh, misogynistic, uh, so you find a lot uh, when it comes to women making our own choices and girls, and uh, um, when it comes to even like um, the spaces that are there, uh, are not both private and uh, and public spaces are not uh, safe for us. So what we usually organize is organizing based any human rights issues we link with it in terms of gender justice issue. Like for example, now there's been COVID. So as COVID affected women, keeping in mind also women and girls, we are not homogeneous. So how does it affect different kind of women? But also in terms of ensuring that we do a lot of political education and ideology on feminist values and organizing. Uh, and organizing meaning in terms, if you look at the history of Kenya, a lot of women contributed even a lot in the, in the liberation struggle, but our story has been erased. People like the, uh, the late Professor Angare Madai, if you see a role in terms of the release of political prisoners in the Freedom Corner, it's never amplified. It usually puts the Professor Wangare Madai, the Nobel Peace Laureate, and not looking the role she played, people like Mekatilili Wameza, and even the current generation, like where we are now as young feminists, where in Kenya, most of us are bashed and we get a lot of resistance. But the idea of ensuring like uh, we are able to disrupt, demystify the the the, um, the retrogressive culture that works against us, to ensure like girls and women are able to be in their full potential. And also recognizing that we are also primary stakeholders when it comes to peace, development, security, human rights, and um, also gender equality, because you cannot be saying you're talking about gender. And that's why I'm very clear, I'm not saying only gender, but I'm very clear in terms of gender justice, including the LGBTQ folks and um, um, the fact that um, most even of unpaid care work is done by women. But when do and girls, but when do unpaid care work is not seen as work. But when men do the unpaid care work, is seen as work. So ensuring that we're able to center this kind of a conversation within the front here, and especially being in the ground in the community, to ensure that we have that voice also where women and girls can be able to be themselves. But the most important thing is about centering that voice. What are these that work against us, women and girls, and women human rights defenders? So I'm looking forward, and the fact that this is 16 days of activism, where we are able, like, um, in terms of also an engagement, we focus also a lot on kids, teaching, like teaching even uh, the kids when they are growing up, how do you respect girls, even if it's boys? And I also like to live in an enabling environment that ensures there's opportunity for everybody and not only for one gender. Yeah, so I don't talk much, we'll talk as we continue the discussion, I think. No, but this is very important to let us know the different things that are happening in the field, in the places where most of these issues are, are rampant and where there are even more layers to the issues that contribute to this becoming a major problem as we go along. So thank you for that, uh, Rachel. Lastly, but not least, we will have Robert Burale telling us a little more about how he does what he does and how it connects to gender work. Welcome, Robert. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. As I said earlier, I do quite a number of things. But what I would want, I would want to put in the heart of, um, you know, I've been doing the men's conference. I have the Robert Broyles School of Leadership and I have a mentorship program. And the mentorship program really is to uh, raise men and women to understand who they are in society and not grow up looking at each other as enemies because we realize sometimes now we do have 
boys and girls and the female and male gender fighting each other. Yet, if we're supposed to work together for upward mobility, and also, of course, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to make sure the men understand their God-given uh, grace over their lives and for the women also to understand what God put in them before they were born so they grow up with the right identity because growing up with the wrong identity is uh, conquering the wrong mountain successfully. Or you're the kind of person whose right leg is on a banana peel and your left leg is on a slippery floor. So we have people quickly uh, driving very fast towards the wrong direction. So we need to bring people back to the table and make them understand that we are not fighting each other, but we are supposed to work together for upward mobility. I hear you and in, indeed that is, that is all valuable work. So one of the first questions uh, we had prepared for you before we even get into the technical definitions of what a gender stereotype is. For the benefits of those who are probably hearing this for the first time, maybe we start with some examples. What is a gender stereotype that you grew up with? So I'm gonna split this across the panel. I will have three panelists discussing examples and I'll ask another three to just give us a general explanation of them. So I will direct this question to Burale, yes, Robert Burale. What are some of the examples of gender stereotypes that we have, you have encountered, either from your childhood or even leading up to present day? Well, um, two things. Uh, number one, as a boy growing, when I was growing up as a male child, is um, a boy should never show vulnerability. And if you show that, you're a weak man. And now in my older self, see, I'm not a very young man with my silver fox, but I'm not too old anyway. Um, I will always speak about uh, um, when divorce happens. Uh, people know I'm a divorced man, uh, minister of the gospel, a public figure. So you, you get a lot of uh, judgment like uh, you as a uh, preach of the gospel. Why uh, are you preaching the gospel? Why are you talking to us about relationships yet you cannot keep on your own? So I'm, I'm sure I'm going off topic, but I need to bring that because many divorced people, and I've been uh, leading quite a few of them in, in uh, an association we have, feel that they're judged in that area. It's a stereotype that every divorced man should not stand up and talk about. Understood. Him. Thank you for that. Uh, I will also invite Hilary to tell us, uh, to give us an example of a gender stereotype that you either had when you were growing up or something that you have is still true for you in, in present day. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, for me, the, the one that stands the most out is uh, women, girls need to be shy. Uh, you have to say less, you have to, you know, uh, shy out from uh, public speaking. Um, I'm not naturally, uh, uh, you know, an interest person, <laughs> but I had to... I, I, I wanted to be, <laughs> I tried really hard not to speak up <laughs> when I was really young. Um, as a, in, generally, as a culture in Ethiopia, we don't speak that much, by the way. Uh, even like I'm the most, I, I think, uh, currently I'm, like I was in Yali and I observed that among the different <laughs> countries, uh, those from Ethiopia were uh, saying less <laughs> because that's how we rest and the women are expected to say much less. So <laughs> I tried very hard to be uh, the you know, like decent, uh, you know, like shy person as a woman. Uh, I didn't succeed, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I, I didn't. <laughs> Because like that, uh, I'm here because I'm not uh, you know shying away from the opportunities that I got and I'm, I'm not shying away from what I'm supposed to do in my care and life. Yeah, and that's I think uh, like one of the major norms that bring uh, violence uh, that expects women men to be aggressive and violent and that expects women to be passive. Uh, you know, and some music. It's, yeah. If it's any consolation, I remember even I growing up would be told girls are to be seen and not to be heard. So 
we are one of the rebels in this situation. <laughs> so it's very nice to know. And then I'll finally ask uh, our last uh, panelist to tell us uh, about a gender stereotype that they either had growing up or something that they have had recently in present day. And I'll direct this to Dr. Patience. Unfortunately, you are muted. You so Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can hear me now. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say, uh, starting from what my colleague just said, I'm still even facing this thing because when it comes to public speaking, they expect that if you're a girl or a woman, you know, and you're 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 addressing to a big number of people, that means that you're way be beyond someone's you know you're way beyond what a girl should be or what a woman should be so in kenya Rwanda, they call it ingare that means uh someone who is you know when a child is not disciplined at home or you know a child who is involved in drugs and all that so it's like the parents are kind of like not really much uh giving more, they no longer give the, the child an, an attention as a good child, if I may say. So that's literally what happens to me up to now. So I grew up so timid, I couldn't speak in front of people. And that's one of the things that when I grew up, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, when I grew up, I kind of was like, what should I do for, the, for my fellow girls or for my fellow women who heard such uh uh timid or shying away situations as girls how am i going to empower them so besides that i remember one time when i was in senior two uh, i used to do basketball and uh, my dad would say no you should stop that why because you're going to have a masculine shape so and i was really interested and i was felt like i really enjoy this so it was really hard because I was like, why should I do it? If something that my brother can do, why do they stop me from doing it? So at some times I, I could go play without telling him. So if I could, you know, I could even like we have an opportunity to join the, uh, the basketball academies so that we can, you know, go to bigger teams. So I couldn't have the chance because my dad could tell me, no, you should not go there because you're going to have a muscular shape. So it's something that we are still as well facing as women and girls. Uh, it's, I would say it's really hard and we're still struggling with it, but at least we know that we, we know that we are capable of doing what we want to do. So that's why we're still fighting to way forward to see at least at some point that even men and all we do that we engage men and boys so that at least at some point they'll be able to see that we can do what we can do and they can do what they think that it's only meant for only girls or women. So I'm really glad that today I can be able to use this opportunity as well, be able to talk to many people as possible and share my ideas in Rwanda, we have a proverb that says uh, what a woman can say, if I try to translate it, it's like there, there won't be peace. That means any, any idea or any thought of a woman can't build anything at all. So today, that's literally what uh, women, in um, mostly the married women, are facing. And that's where we have literally divorces, as my colleague said earlier and GBV as well, which is at a high rate. So I would say we are still struggling to see a, a better a better future with, uh, with no gender stereotype, with no gender identification concerning characters and roles. Thank you. That was quite elaborate and I thank you so much for also saying all these things because in a way you have preempted some of the issues we will discuss in this panel. How all these stereotypes contribute to identity for the different genders and how that can be problematic, be it socially, be it uh, at the workplace, be it politically. All these are things that we, all these nuances we cannot uh, go without considering and even unpacking for those who might be truly unaware. And now we will shift gears and I will change the questioning a little. Rachel and Cabello, I hope you do not mind. The next question I was going to ask is, in your opinion, how are stereotypes formed? 
So I'll start with Cabello and then we'll go to Mwikali. Cabello, can you tell us in your opinion how you think these stereotypes come to be? Michelle, I didn't get the last part of the question. Uh, I was um, asking, in your opinion, me. no problem, in your opinion, how do how do you think that stereotypes stereotypes come to be? How are they formed? How are they yes, how are they formulated as stereotypes? Are we clear now? Uh, oh, I see what you mean. I think we, All right. we, we live in societies where yeah, I'm very clear. Thanks. Um, I was saying that we live in societies where if something is done over and over again it sort of becomes a norm. Mm. And because at, at first, those that may see it as a problem don't voice out their, 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 their issues or concerns. And later on, we realize that we've been embracing a way of life or a way of doing things that actually um, makes others suffer. And then we come back to realize that, oh no, we shouldn't have gotten to a point where we allowed this for this long. However, we need to go back a few steps. There was a point where it was very much normal for, I'll, I'll give it in a South African context, where we talk about uh, labor migration, um, where people will move into the big city called Johannesburg, link uh, their villages just to seek after work, right? And in most cases, it was mining. And under those circumstances during apartheid, there, it was more men that were, were required to do this hard labor, leaving women at home, to do to 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 take care of the, the kids and other things that they can do within the households, right? So in that context, it made sense then for people to allow men to go to the cities to go and work. But in the context of today, it's very different that uh, even women can go into the mines because the work done in the mines doesn't only just require physical strength or what we will term masculinity in that in that regard. So. They, sometimes they are a result of what is required at a particular point, whereby the man will come back home and because he was at work the whole day, the woman will be the one cooking. But today the context has... If I'm working, I knock off at five, my partner knocks off at seven. When they come back home, they should find dinner ready because we're living in a society where the, the working hours are different. The responsibility to cook is not something that should be subjected only to women because the circumstances have changed. So in us even correcting what was wrong, we also need to give context. We shouldn't just uh, talk about bashing what was done then. We must remember the context in which it was done. So part of the things that create all these gender stereotypes is how society was built. It's how all these... Um, governments that were running Africa, to be even more specific, were trying to achieve their goals. And in most instances, labor was reserved for men and dealing with uh, chores at home was something that was done mainly by women. So this, that is how most of them were, were, were formed or formulated. And today we have a chance to correct most of them, if not all of them, to a point where we make men aware that the responsibility to eat is not something that should only be your wife's responsibility or your partner's responsibility. Cooking, making food is a basic need. Both men and women, girls and boys, have to be able to cook because we're not living in a society where we need to move far away from home to get jobs. And even if that is the case, it's not only just men that are moving. Even women have the opportunity to leave their homes to go work outside their country to go work outside their city or outside their village and in that way we need to start moving on with the times understanding as men that times have changed and we also need to be playing certain roles that normally we wouldn't play and it was not wrong of the time it was because of the circumstances allowed for such I like that you point that out, that at some point the stereotypes were there to maintain law and order or in some way make things work easier for communities. But I think as we have evolved and moved through different contexts, there has been change. And I think the resistance to change is what has caused this problem. So it's very nice of you to have highlighted that. That was very helpful. I'll quickly now go to Mwikali, Rachel, who will tell us what she, how she feels that or that what she thinks, oh. how she thinks uh, these stereotypes are formed. Rachel? Oh my God. <laughs> so, 
Um, I need also like to follow up on what uh, is it Ka Cabello had said. First, what I usually say and stand for in the gospel of cooking is a survival skill that everybody should learn how to cook. It should not only be designed for women, it's survival skill. When you hear your life is at risk, what do you do? So that is something everybody should learn how to cook and not put it for girls or women. But now coming in terms of now gender roles were defined. If you ask me, basically, it was, it was created to only benefit the men, if you ask me personally. And in terms of this unpacking power and privilege, why will, like in the communities we live, let me talk in the context of Kenya and, uh, and where I'm coming from, and also the few other countries I've been within the continent. If you look in terms of shifting, why will men feel bad cooking? But to, like I give an example, but if it's, a, it's about putting commercial in it or money in it, they don't feel bad cooking. I can say I'm a chef. Men can say that they are a chef, they are working in Sarova or Sandy, blah, blah, blah. But do these men, the same men who cook in, in those places, come and cook for their kids and their partner? They don't. So it's about power and privilege. And for me, on this, I'm usually very clear in terms of also like uh, on patriarchal system and structure and how it works within the society. So that it's, it's, it catalyzes on how also women are able to challenge this kind of power within the society that works against them and girls. Because you find if you're a woman, even sometimes for me personally, I see that I'm like, I'm, I'm, it seems like, and those women, when you grow up in the community, people used to say, this is those aunts that they, 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 they talk too much or they challenge power and they are, they're sort of not sort of look, quote, unquote, an African value. Because if you look, even for the most women within the society who have been able to challenge these gender roles that works against women and girls, they are called sort of names. And that's why also we come in terms of what is culture within our own context. Because for me, what I believe culture is created by people. If we have sort of created our culture is meeting here for Zoom for one hour, that's our culture. So it can change. So if we have this culture that we usually use it as an excuse and say our African culture is in a culture whereby if uh, we are buying even toys for kids, we only buy pink for girls and blue for boys, that's problematic. Or if you also we are setting up standards of books, syllabus in schools, like the and putting the roles of women is this and the roles of men are this, that's very problematic. We need to challenge that. Because now the way you are saying, it, it does not mean that women have not been able to participate in these processes that have been also like um, seen as if they are not their roles. And this also will come to, to a point whereby also, with all the due respect of religion, I respect religion and uh, for the religious people. But I feel also sometimes in terms of neocolonialism and uh, colonization, it played a critical role in terms of framing the gender roles. Like, for example, when you say the man is the head and the woman is the neck, what does that mean? It means whatever a man says, it's correct. It means whatever a man's, like, uh, even if they make decisions that are not progressive, it's fine. And if you look in terms of also, like, um, being a vocal woman, and this also, like, it comes also to also political leadership and leadership and changes within our body. You find that if you're a vocal woman, you'll be told, no, women should not, you can intimidate men. Why? Why are you talking so much? Why are you so like um, very aggressive? And this for me, it's problematic. It's one of those generals that works against women and girls in terms of fulfilling their own potential. But it's okay for a man to be vocal. It's okay for a man to be radical. That's problematic. So for me, it goes back to unpacking power and privilege. And for me, yeah, it's also like a responsibility. I usually throw it to men and um, also, maybe Brale on you also, because also you have the male conference. I believe also the response is not the labor of women to teach men on how to, to do these things. These things are automatic, like you use your head. But it's the reality whereby you know it's common sense, I need to be doing this. I know my wife, she's tired. Or my partner, she's tired, I need to do this. Or I know as Michael, my partner uh, is tired, I need to do this and this. But not the fact, you know, even for the working class women, they are still working and they have to come back and do the work in the house that is not considered at work. You know, even like the way we said cooking, you have to, to do like a lot of mathematics in your head when you're planning to cook. It's like a plan, the way people plan programs. Like I need to cook this for dinner, this is how I need to budget, and this is what I need to do if it's washing the same. So it's problematic when, when we don't see even unpaid care work as work. But when men do it, it's work. So it's, it's our collective responsibility. We should not only be burdened on men and women, it's a collective responsibility where 
society, community, and different stakeholders are able to say it's our collective work we need to do, all of us. But also not forgetting in terms of also like um, on how we socialize even our kids in the communities and the areas we come from. And even opportunity-wise. How many of us, even when it comes, for example, to land rights, even land negotiation in Kenya, which sometimes makes, you know, some, most of the time makes me annoyed. Like even still in this area of the century, for you as a woman to go and buy a land somewhere or you, for your parents to go and buy a land somewhere or in terms of also inheritance, there has to be like driven by patriarchal, uh, uh, by patriarchs. Like it's only men that are allowed to negotiate and not women. Why is it that it's only men are allowed, and it, as much as it's your money, like why is it that men are allowed to negotiate and not women to negotiate? So you see where now it comes to power because they know when they feel they are the ones controlled, it feels that the ones they are in that. Why is it if I go out with a guy and I'm the one who is paying bill, I'm, I'm paying transport, they'll be like, okay, taking the bill to the guy without asking me, or who should I give the bill? And it's very unfortunate because of this, the way I'm saying uh, the patriarchy that has been catalyzed within our own community, that it has also been mastered in such a way women are able to be internalized in it. And uh, when they are doing it, Without the political consciousness and understanding, they'll never understand it's, it's, a, it's something that has been created to oppress us. Because for me, I feel generals are also oppressive. And also you will see that um, even when it comes to discussions, when, when people will tell you, you know, Rachel, you are feminist, but leave your feminist outside the door when you're in the house. You're a feminist. I'm like, no, my friend, feminist is in my DNA 24-7. But it does not mean if I have a partner, we can't live together. We'll live together as long as they respect me and I respect me. And as long as we understand this, this is where we are sort of to be. So I, I still believe I, it's the right timing. And I, I love the, the kind of conversation, the way it is, even the panelists. And seeing where it's our, each one of us responsibility in shifting these narratives, in shifting these realities. Because where we are, we can't maintain. We, we can't maintain in maintaining the status quo of oppressing women and girls when it comes to gender roles. No, we can't do that. Yeah. One of the things that's coming out from that very powerful, almost very personal uh, interaction with uh, gender stereotypes and how they've affected women in general is the fact that some of these things are so deeply internalized that even changing them becomes quite a challenge. And I can understand the challenges that come with you know, change and how the resistance to change, especially where there were benefits once being enjoyed by a, a particular party and them having to relinquish some of those benefits. I, I totally understand how difficult it is. I mean, you are really right that this is work for everybody. Everybody is involved. Nobody will be left behind. I have just been alerted that we have one of our final panelists, Nyawira, is on board with us. Hi, Nyawira. Hello? OK. But as we're going through, I will touch base with Nyawira as soon as she's ready. But as we go along, I wanted to know, I do hear that, I mean, I, I understand the different, the difficult, what, the difficult gender stereotypes that exist already. But I'll throw this question to Hilawis. In your opinion, do you think that there are good gender stereotypes? Are there things that, I mean, is it all bad? So is there like a good gender stereotype? I think um, Fabiola was mentioning how uh, the, stere the stereotypes come up into the community. Um, they were formed to support us, you know, survive for the time and uh, being in the context we were living in. They, uh, but as we evolve, once uh, you know, like those norms give you power. Uh, takes some gives powers to some to one gender and takes power from the other, and to you know once you get power you don't want to lose it. <laughs> That's a privilege you don't want to miss. You do it consciously or subconsciously, you know, uh, but you don't want to lose it. So uh, for that you create another norm, you know. So uh, maybe for first. Women had to cook because the men were traveling uh, outside and collecting or gathering something uh, for the family. But later on, women should only cook and say less because they will uh, challenge the norm, go out and do more. So norms, uh, some norms from their intention were not bad. They actually helped us survive. 
and function as society. But other norms can end one uh, child, you know, like uh, mm, perpetuate it, perpetuate the bad or the wrong side of it, and other created another problem by, you know, uh, adding uh, other norms. So for me, not all norms are created as wrong or not all norms are bad for gender equality uh, because norms are what holds us together and norms are what created to the community overall. That's what basically uh, coexistence is created by. So that's how we coexist, not exist based on the laws and regulations or international provisions. We coexist because uh, community laws and, and the community norms exist. So not all gen norms, even gender norms, are necessarily bad. But as I say, as I mentioned earlier, based on our needs, based on uh, you know what to need to continue and how wh how we should survive, we have to come up with a way of rewriting the norms, rewriting and challenging the norms. So we, we, we won't be get reading off every social and economic norm and you know social norm overall. But we will we need to rewrite it and we okay. need to critically question them so that we can uh, see the consequence for gender equality and gender-based violence, particularly gender violence. So uh, when we talk about gender norms, we need to be very, really careful why we are challenging it. You know, so like uh, I heard Rachel talking about, you know, mentioning and saying little things about uh, African feminism, Afro feminism, radical feminism. And I think for me, not all feminism works for. Sorry, you've muted yourself. Sorry, sorry, just unmute. I don't know what happened. Really there. Sorry. <laughs> So I will uh, restate the statement. So I, uh, her, I heard Rachel mentioning a little bit about feminism ideologies. And I believe every uh, one of us, especially women, we, we lived in, well, those women who, uh, f you know, uh, stand out of the norm, you know, stand out of uh, the context you are expected to, you lived by some feminist ideology whether you like it or not. But what what that yeah. feminist ideology did to your life and which norms were you challenging is the main thing we, we should talk about. So we should be careful about when we talk about norms, when we talk about feminism, because not all feminist ideologies works for everyone. Not all norms are bad. So we should be careful and we should, for me, we should be, you know, like, contextualize the feminist ideology, the norm ideology, the change ideology we are taking on upon. So I'm more of African feminist than a radical feminist. I'm not saying I'm against feminists because I'm a feminist, <laughs> but um, I think when we stand up, when we say, when we work, especially as a professionals, when we talk about feminism and when we talk about change in norms, we should think about what norms we want to change, which norms we want to change. So I don't necessarily say all norm is bad because we are that's what we are holding us uh, together. Yeah, thank you. And it's really interesting that you have pointed out that, you know, we can all be logged onto this conversation at different levels and in different, in different contexts. And I think I understand how everybody is if affected differently by this. And so they will show up from their point of interaction with their issues. So that's very also important to note. I will also ask uh, Robert Burale the same question. In your opinion, even just based on what you are familiar with, do you think that there are certain elements of gender stereotypes that are, I mean, is it all bad? Is it all gloom and doom? Are there things that are working, you know, to you? You will answer that as you see fit, Robert. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I like what the other speakers have spoken, and I do agree with them. Sadly, sometimes when we hear the, the word stereotype, we tend to lean towards a misguided perception about something based on influence, whether it's media, culture, and all those things. But uh, yes, uh, as our previous speaker who has just spoken, 
uh, rightly put it, not all is doom and gloom, but we have been tuned to think when you hear the word stereotype. And yes, rightly so, um, it means then it's something, a misguided uh, if, uh, perception about something. But allow me also, and I think uh, Madam Wikali is doing a fantastic job and I'm, I'm glad she's, she's a very well articulated lady. And I know I will always come from the place of the Bible. Remember, I'm a minister of the gospel. So that is uh, one thing that I hold very dear to me. Yes, there is when we say, who say the man should be the head and, and, and uh, the, the lady is the neck. Uh, we can't have two heads. Um, and and uh, allow me to explain further. Uh, both are heads, but in different ways. There is a way a man is a head, but cannot work without the headship of the woman. What do I mean? Uh, we look at the head. The head has the eyes, has the nose, has the mouth, and has the ears. Okay. And it is the eyes that have the vision. And that's why. And the, the truth of the matter, I have had the privilege of escorting many young men for dowry negotiations. And most of the time, it is the mothers of the girl who ask, oh, young man, where are you going to lead my child to? I'm giving you my daughter. Is she safe with me? So it's clear that uh, a man must have the vision to take the family forward. Uh, that's why the eyes are there and the nose to smell there is danger for the family. The mouth is there to speak where you want the family to go and the ears to have your eyes on the ground to know where your family is at. But remember, this head is useless without the neck. It is the neck that decides to turn where the head to where it's supposed to go. So a woman has the power. But now that's why I said when I introduced myself is that we need to understand that we are not fighting from opposing sides. And if we do that, then there has to be a winner and the loser. Let's understand that we must fight on the same side. And that's why these stereotypes, the negative ones have come to bring division among the male and the female. And that's, and let me be honest with you, and I've seen a comment from somebody, even in uh, GBVs, do you know men are also victims? I was hosting the International Men's Day um, a few days ago, and there was a man there who lost his sight because his ex-wife poured acid on him. But now when that man speaks, people are trying to tell him, no, 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 take it easy. You can't say a woman did this to you. That's also a stereotype. You understand? So we need to come to a place of convergence and understand we are not fighting each other. Like our lady said here, that um, not all feminism is good. There is a level of fem feminism that, that says feminism is bashing men. And that's not how it's supposed to be. There, there has to be some diluting in some, and gladly of the, everybody who has spoken here, I'm not seeing any toxic feminism, but we have to be very realistic here. So for me, I think my work today was just to bring a biblical perspective and understand, yes, we are the same, but at the same time, we're different. It's a conundrum. Same in as far as even ladies, it's inherent in them. They would say, nowadays, there are no men. I said, what do you mean there are no men? Ah, there are no men to lead us. And then maybe sometimes when the men lead, then the lady, same ladies say, who says he is the only one who can lead? So please, let's drive this conversation to bringing us together and saying we got to work together. I am right-handed, but my right hand needs my left hand for my body to balance. We need to work as a team. Yes, um, there are some things that need to be changed. We cannot grow or uh, raise our kids saying oh, a woman's place is the kitchen. I don't agree with that. Uh, we can also not say that a boy should not show vulnerability. We, and that is why now we have gone into men having depression. Women contemplate suicide. Men actualize suicide. Why? The stereotype. In Kiswali, that means a man must struggle hard. A man should not cry. A man should not show vulnerability. You understand? And, and then that is why some stereo, stereotype takes us into dangerous places. And it's so interesting that uh, all these things are coming up. I'm almost afraid to ask all the panelists because all these things will emerge. But it's also very important to, to be careful about how we do it because, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. So I, I totally I understand how this is progressing moving forward. But I also think it's very important to also remember that it, there have been, this is years of pain and years of, of oppression showing up now. It's, it's going to be heated whether we like it or not. And so 
allow me to move on to one of our next questions. And I like that you have, I mean, all of you have managed to bring out um, the different ways that gender stereotypes kind of show up in the different um, sectors around our socialization. And I think um, for it to be more like a balanced uh, conversation, I'll go in a few, I'll probably lead the conversation a little bit, but I want to ask um, Rachel, for example, with the women that we know, or rather the women that you encounter in your work, how do you think uh, gender stereotypes have manifested when it comes to earning a living or workplace dynamics? How do you feel that their gender, gender stereotypes have manifested in their places of work? Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> First, for clarity, for clarity. Um, when it comes to feminist struggle, I agree in terms of the politics around black feminism, white feminism, and everything. Feminism stands for, for a lot of things when it comes to human rights. That's anti-militarization, for social justice, equal opportunity for, for all genders, LGBTQ rights, you see. And, and the moments like, the reality is that when you're fighting an oppression, you even you being a Kenyan, you cannot be in a good pay with your oppressor. The same way most now Kenyans are complaining about the government with COVID. Who is smiling? They're all calling out government. So in the same way, if a woman is oppressed, you don't expect them to be good to the oppressor. Even me personally, I can never be good to my oppressor. That's black and white. So I think it's good to understand also that there are also patriarchy princesses within the movement. And that's why when you see vocal women, now you're talking about gender stereotypes. The ones who are vocal, they'll be named, these are the radicals men eta and everything if they have chosen that their path they have their own issues we also have men who are uh, who are women haters they hate women but now coming to the point of also violence when it comes to gender justice anyone whether you are a man or a woman lgbtq person you should not go through violence that's paramount that's people can't negotiate that's a criminal case and i think now when you talk about now when about gender roles now i'm coming to that point so that i respond even if you are that man, you're going through violence, stop keeping quiet, speak out. Women, you know, the, the thing with us women, the good thing is that we are organizing in a manner we are like, everything works against us. Everything works, the fact I'm a black woman, the fact I'm a woman living in slum, a young woman, things works against me. So you find my life is consistently on fighting on daily basis. And for me, that's why for me, I'm very angry and I'm very angry in terms of I cannot watch oppression of myself or any other woman or any girl happening and then you expect me to smell that one, it's no go zone. That one I don't compromise. And now coming to, in terms of also the, the women we work with and the women we stay with, even me, my person, even the field I am in of activism, even in this country, you find a lot of us women do a lot of work, but the payment is too little. The women like who live here who go to do construction work in Isili. If I compare, I've had, I've had that discussion with their the counterparts who are guys. Guys are paid like 600, the women are paid 400. So you can see there's inequality in terms of payments. There's inequality in terms of quantifying the work uh, both genders are doing. So you find still it oppresses women and it oppresses like even um, in terms of um, the economic wise. And if you look in terms of also like... Um, they're organizing, even in, I know for those who also like into other workspaces. Why is it that when it comes to certain positions, they'll be like, we are giving this to men and not to women. And what will be this oppressive excuse they'll use? You, you are a woman, if you get pregnant. You see the biology is usually used now against that as form of gender roles, where also the gender role which is seen as a woman role is to, for, for reproduction. But also at the same time, sex cannot only be used for production, it's also used for pleasure. So you see all this gender role, when it comes even to sex, pleasure, and sexuality, it doesn't work on behalf and favor of women. When it comes even now with COVID pandemic, and now looking in terms of the family, when he said, even when Brady said about the man being the head. And the reason why I was very clear in saying that women are not homogeneous is that women exist in different, in different ways. And if you, we, we live in such a way, we are also quantifying that a family is where always there's a man, a woman, and kids, it's problematic. We have most families that are also women added. Does we, do we mean that also those are not added households with women who are powerful. So we have to be very clear when also we are unpacking these things so that it doesn't look we only fall into this also part of role that a family exists where there is a man, a woman, and kids. Because there are a lot of even most families that 
are women added my family is also a woman added but now looking in terms on now we have to shift we can't deny also the media play a critical role a lot of women like when we did during this covid because we have been responding now at first as coalition for grassroots human defender to move from a human to, to the work we do on daily basis to now focus on humanitarian work, but with the lens of human rights and feminist approach and gender justice approaches, we realize like a lot of women who do informal businesses, which quote unquote people will call informal, but for me I see it's businesses. They are the most affected. But when it comes to even the, the jobs, the one we called uh, even the government package, they're not reaching out to these women. And even if it's the youth, because Kwa Vijana, it only goes to Kwa Vijana, not the, the boys and not to the girls, which has been a discussion where we are pushing even our local administration here to involve more girls to access Kazi for Vijana and not be able to, to only get it to the boys. Because you realize the space, the way I say it is not enabling. And uh, for those, it, and the, kind of, the kind of opportunity that is given, it has to be like the one who has, who can fight. And you know, also, also us women in nature, we don't like where there's violence. We don't like to be in a violent space. We don't like, and violence, and I mean violence, and also being that in 16 days of activism, we need also to be clearly that violence is not only physical violence. It is economical violence, psychological violence. And looking in terms even of the existing cases that have been going on, I'm trying to link different uh, themes, like femicide cases, which makes me really annoyed. Looking where we started to end femicide in this country, you will see it's a violence against women, it's a murder. But the way it was framed, it was framed in such a way that it, can, it dehumanizes the girls and the women that were killed, but humanizes the guys who have been either the perpetrators or the, the people catalyzing that kind of violence. You could see even the, the musician, the way they were talking about this kind of songs that were catalyzing violence. But the same even guys, you will not call them and tell them what they're saying. It's bad. It's also like, um, it's, it's also like um, influence violence, which we should not all exist. You see? So it's, it's, it's very important. So it's like all of us call out this kind of violence. All of us call fighting femicide in this country and, and refusing to use the moral card because I, I don't like the whole idea sometimes because what is moral to you might not be moral to me. It's like the same way, my dress, my choice. What do you think is decency to you is not decency to me. So if I choose to be in a certain way, people should respect that as long as I'm not violating someone's rights. And that's also the fact that looking all this spectrum of gender in, in, in such a way, it looked in intersectionality manner. Like who brings what? What can it, can it be paid? How does that contribute to this? What can be brought to this? How do we quantify that to be work? So I think it's very important. I know all of us come from different spaces, from different backgrounds, but we have to be able, it's a learning process, but also we have to also be able to teach ourselves to learn this thing. Nobody will come and teach you about feminist politics or gender justice perspective, but personally, deep down in your heart, in your heart, you know, like even I'm Wekali, I cannot perpetuate violence. It's wrong. I should not be violating people because I can say because I'm a feminist, blah, blah, blah. But the fact that I fight for my own existence, people should respect that. Yeah, thank you. Wow, those are so many issues that I actually had difficulty keeping a track of all of them. But these are all pertinent to this conversation. And I feel like um, there is a place and, and really a space for all these conversations to be had. And one of the things I admire about what I'm getting from your contribution is how we should all be holding space for each other. Um, we are all coming from different points of enlightenment when it comes to this subject. And so helping each other catch up with each other or move closer to a more inclusive, more diverse uh, community and letting people really just be themselves, expression of self is what I'm really getting from your contribution. And I'm looking at the time and we are now into our second hour. So panelists, Unfortunately, I will have to put a cap on how much time you get per subject matter. So kindly limit yourself to about a minute, a minute and a half. So then that way we can get um, a more, what's the word, a more inclusive contribution from everybody in our panel. Nyawira, I'm told you are now ready for us. Confirm that you can, kindly confirm that you can hear, hear us. Can you hear me at least? Okay, and then she drops off from the call. That's unfortunate. Um, it's okay, we'll wait for her to come back. But I again pose this question to Cabello, who can give us uh, the context from where he, he, he currently resides.
Cabello, how do gender stereotypes uh, show up when it comes to women and their places of work or their access to opportunities in the workplace? However you want to answer that. Cabello, are you still with us? There you are, okay. Just yesterday, we were looking at statistics that were coming out of the UN report regarding opportunities for women, regarding how women are still earning very less from, from what men are earning. And it, 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 it actually gives us a very, very, very gloom and very uninspiring picture of how how things are looking from a gender perspective. And you realize that that is a result of patriarchy in the bigger scheme, that when men are given opportunities, we are failing to let go. We are failing to make space for women to occupy the very same spaces because it makes no sense, even in a South African context, to say that we have less than 20% of women who are CEOs, in particular Black women, but we have qualified women in our space that can actually be given those opportunities. So I think for me, one of the biggest problems is that the, the patriarchal ways of life are so dire, they are so they are so erosive that they, they are creating spaces where as men we are not even willing to give up certain positions from even political uh, positions. I mean, to be in 2020, look at American um, elections and having America has been around for so long, the democracy has been around for so long, but it's only now that they're celebrating the first black deputy female president that for me it just shows how how we are not moving at the pace that we are ideally supposed to be moving at and even here locally when you talk about political opportunities and uh, when you talk about women being at the forefront you realize that there's still quite a high number of limitations and it's, it's because of we are not we are we are not taking our focus to put it on one thing or in one basket to say that this is our goal for 2030, this is our goal for 2036. But that is not just a South African problem. You even look at the UN and the AU, when they talk about different deadlines on what they're going to do to improve the lives of women, on what they're going to do to ensure that more women are placed in positions of power and influence, you realize that the time comes and passes and not even half of their goals are reached. So I think for me, we need to be deliberate. We need to be resolute about the things that we, we're saying. It can't just be a question of discussions. It can't just be a question of webinars. It can't just be a question of conferences. It must be something that we can measure. It must be something that we can look at and say, this is how far we've come. I couldn't agree more with you that of course there's been progress but we have moved so slowly to get to where we are today and yet even more work uh, exists or like there's an opportunity to, for, for us to cover even more ground and now we will shift the context and we will move from the workplace and probably move to relationships and or other kinds of relationships let me say like friendships for example modern day or the present day society I'll say, Nyawira, are you, are you good for us, Nyawira? I want to confirm I think, that you can hear. I hope so. I can it's hear okay. you. Can you we, hear me? I can hear you clearly and I can see you now. Paul, I, I really admire your awesome. resilience to stay on this call. <laughs> I know how challenging it can be and that's okay. <laughs> I know. Happy to have you oh. now. <laughs> right? That's hectic. And so very quickly, yes, very quickly, I want to hear from you. How yeah. do gender in your line of work, because I know you're mm -hmm. a producer and a music artist. And I want to ask you about relationships because I'm sure those are things that you probably write about or share interests in. And so in your opinion, how do gender stereotypes manifest when it comes to modern day relationships, modern day friendships, and are there problem areas? Is it all good? Is it all bad? What do you think? Did we just lose her again? Nyarira? Yes, you just did. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, guys. I'm here. Can you, did you can hear, you hear me? I didn't. Yes, I I'm sorry, you. you have to repeat it. Okay. Not a problem. Not a problem. Can I so hear? what I had asked is, 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I had asked yeah. is, how, in your opinion, in your line of work, and also just in generally as a person who interacts with other people, how do you think that gender stereotypes have shown up in terms of relationships and present day friendships, for example? Okay, so I, I I followed this conversation for a bit um, when my internet was acting out. I'm, I'm acting up. I'm sorry, you guys. And um, I picked up Rachel t- talking about the LGBT community because the whole conversation has been going on um, referring to gender as a as a as a binary, you know. And the way that I know it, gender is a spectrum. You know, you cannot say male, female, and end it there there's so many in-betweens you know um but uh i'm just saying i'm just putting it out there there's gender queer folks and there's people who do not identify as um male or female and then now that now makes the stereotype the concept of now gender stereotyping even worse for such individuals but um these are the individuals i want to talk about by the way i'm here for the alphabet people um (laughs) <laughs> so in terms of relationships, stereotypes are coming from, uh, like someone said earlier, from the way that systems are run. So a system that is well equipped to, to involve everybody that would not naturally have stereotypes that we would say are negative. Because stereotypes are not necessarily negative all the time. There's a thing we say about, oh, people with, okay, this is selfish, but people with dreadlocks are gorgeous, you know, naturally. It's a stereotype as well. But now when we talk, when, when we talk talking about gender stereotypes and, and relationships, there's, um, let me talk about the, the one gender one. Um, friendships. It's very hard to see genuine fr- platonic friendships uh, between, say, uh, cis men, cis women, because naturally it is assumed that there will be a sexual inclination in that. Oh dear. I can't believe that she was just about to share that and then she disappeared from the call. <sighs> okay, what we can do is that for everybody who's probably m- maybe a-, a bit unfamiliar with uh, some of those terms, just note them down and for your own reading to, sh- to show your commitment to this discussion and this issue, do some research, read a book, pick up, pick up an article today and see how well you can, you can understand this conversation even just for yourself. Understand your limits and see your blind spots and move to a point of knowledge. Um, I'm really disappointed that Nyawira was about to bring such an amazing um, contribution to this discussion. And I will still go back to her when she finally logs on. But I think we have also covered how leadership uh, shows up, or rather how gender stereotypes um, manifest when it comes to leadership. And noticed uh, Mwikali pointed out that most opportunities tend to be, especially the C-suite types, uh, typically will continue, or is it Cabello who mentioned that the percentages are still so low and there's a whole report that details the extent to just how, you know, we are still unequal an, an or like the inequality is still rampant in the workplace. Uh, Nyawera, I see you have logged us, like you've just joined the call. I think it's very important for us to hear what you have said just before we move on. Nyawera, confirm that you're able to hear me and to at least we can see your video. Nyawira? Okay. She's now completely dropped off. Um, We'll put a pin on that because I think it's very important for us to get back there. But very quickly, uh, we will now move on to something else that I wanted to hear um, about how gender stereotypes are harming men because we are very clear about how they harm women and we are quite vocal about it. The people who I don't hear say enough about these situations is the men themselves, where they are being affected by a gender stereotype. And so I will pose this to Hilwat, Hilawit, sorry, Hilawit, kindly tell us um, in your line of work or just in your general opinion, based on the knowledge that you have, how do gender stereotypes um, harm men? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the first thing is uh, we don't see them as being the victims. Uh, So when and uh, where they are victims, they don't get sufficient uh, protection, sufficient services, sufficient response. Uh, I don't think we we even have 
we have very, very limited resource and uh, support around gender-based violence overall, and much more or less for men. So I think uh, the stereotype that uh, men, all, not all, but like men are the perpetrators, uh, you know, like creates a barrier for them to get the service when they are the victims. The other is, uh, because we uh, have uh, gender stereotypes around men being like manly and you know the masculinity stereotype overall creates more perpetrators if they are not perpetrators they have to they don't even know how to stand against it so we don't we, we never t teach men how to stand against gender based violence generally so it harms them because even if they want to, they don't know how to. So like the stereotypes, uh, one, it, it makes them uh, victims. If they are not the victims, they don't know how to support or how to stand against it because the stereotypes expect them and at least not to dismiss uh, the stereotypes that are, that are creating the violence that we see now. Uh, and finally, uh, where they are uh, against gender-based violence, where they are standing against the stereotypes that are creating the violence we see now, they are seen as feminine, you know? So it, it, by itself, it creates an identity crisis for men. You know, they, uh, they are supposed to be something and they don't know how to be, you know, like how to even oppose it. So uh, it creates identity crisis among, among boys and men. Uh, and to solve it, I would say we have to rewrite the norms and we have to rewrite the stereotypes that we see uh, today. And uh, like uh, even as we who thinks we are working on gender and we know a lot about gender and this masculine how to dismantle the norms, uh, I, I think we know very very small amount or we we have a very small amount of knowledge to do it. And we are, we are not providing sufficient support for men and boys to be part of uh, the change. So I think that's the main uh, issue they face as men and boys, yeah. Thank you for that. And I'll quickly, I noticed my co-moderator is here. Omeka, I will be touching base with you shortly. But before we get into uh, our interactions on the comment section, I'll also ask Dr. Patience, you've been awfully quiet, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but we'd like to hear in your context uh, where you work or in your immediate, let's say your country, how have uh, problems or other gender stereotypes uh, harmed men in your society based on what you have seen? Oh, thank you. Uh, I would say, uh, just as my colleague said, it's, I don't see men being so victimized that much, I would say like for women, for women and girls. Uh, but uh, basing on what was there it, concerning the roles, let's say at home, uh, you would say that if a man has to go or, you know, have bread, get bread for the whole family, that means something that is literally can be done by both a man and woman. So if he or if he has that a responsibility as the only person, that means it might be so hard for him. So uh, that's what I would say. Uh, one of the things that would I would say that would affect men uh, in concerning the gender stereotypes, but generally it's it's more of women and girls being victimized concerning gender stereotypes because they are considered as the weakest people, I would say. They're considered so weak, they are considered not so some they're considered people who cannot be of as productive as they 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 think they they might be so it's like it's not really i would say it's not like um men are really victimized by gender stereotypes cuz they are considered as these the strongest people the people who are going to be productive people who are going to be, you know, they are the ones more exposed to more opportunities. But concerning my country, I would say that at least we are uh, a step ahead because we are now being given the opportunities 
to be, you know, give, being given their platforms to express ourselves as girls and women. And when it comes to occupation as well, because we are, uh, our government is really trying hard to at least have women uh, on boards, more women on board than, than men, because in all sectors, I would say. So it's a progress, but that doesn't take away the fact that the reality should seem where that gender stereotype is being practiced you can still have that leadership we can still have that platform but when it comes to our homes it's not really the same thing that we are going to be seeing out there so more work still needs to be done and uh, yeah in one way or the other it's going to be beneficial to both sexes or both genders men men and women so that's i hear I you say. and i understand that um I think in that niche, it's mostly that women are showing up as the, the weaker sex. And for that reason, it's just a blanket statement across the different aspects of um, life, which is really unfair. Uh, very quickly, I will invite uh, Omeka to kind of talk about our comment section and see what reactions we are getting. I think we are almost out of time. So Robin, kindly take over from here as we take a pulse of what the conversation has, you know, contributed to people's thinking and the people who are watching live. Robin? Thank you so much, Michelle. If you can hear me, please lift up your thumb. I need to know I'm audible. Awesome. Thank you so much. So the conversation on this back end of mine, the, the comment section, my WhatsApp is also on fire. It's lit. I've just received a video, which I think I will be sharing in a few minutes. Um, to break the ice, the conversation has been very, I'd say scintillating because English is, you know, does not lack character when it, is, when it comes to defining these things. So let me go straight to what our people have been saying. We have gentlemen and ladies, we have Bundu Pandit saying he's tuned in from Givungori. Big up yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dennis Oketch, he's tuned in from Athi River. We have Willie Oeba, he's saying great insights. Dennis Oketch again, he says, I am glad that today the gender discussion arena is characterized by discussions of empowering both genders. And like yesterday, periods where 90% of gender discussions were on empowering women. Of course, this was at a time when I think Burale was talking. Um, Karanja Wangui says, Karanja Wangui says, Nikondani, Dani, Tokahapa CBD. He also says, This is such an amazing discussion. Ivanke Sindirangu says, Here we are. I want to take our attention straight to a video, to, to a comment by Mulunesh Woche, who says, The belief that empowering women means disempowered men. What about the effect of the good woman stereotype, which has also been perpetrated by women themselves, especially the older generation? We have Masi Kaleche who says, most of the men are victims. Last night, one of my male friends saw a Twitter and he asked to meet me asking where I get the courage to paint such shameful things on social media. Well, the truth is that the man is a victim and has been in a prison of confusion and shame. He is afraid of how harshly the society will judge him. Men are also humans and need equal protection. Of course, he's touching on a number of issues. I'm seeing Dennis Oketch again says that Kaleche's question is very good. Generally, the comment section was alive. I'm seeing Daniel Onyango saying very interesting perspective from Rachel Muikali. Rachel Muikali umepokea pongezi pale. Then we have Daniel Onyango again saying, Rachel Muikali, thanks for representing the voices of many youths within the informal settlements. Very articulate and also informative. Now, uh, uh, Cabello and, and Burale had to leave for other engagements they had at 12.15 p.m. Kenyan time, but I want to take this chance to, to play for you a video that has just been sent to me, and I feel it adequately describes what we are describing today as gender stereotypes. 
um, this video does not represent the does not represent the 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 views the opinions or the intentions of the partners who support this live stream uh, so let's all have a laugh <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw that. <laughs> <You ready? laughs> okay. Asante Nisana, I will think I will, I, I'm done with the comments. I will hand over to you, Michelle, uh, for further direction. So, Michelle, Asante. Uh, thank you for that light moment, considering the heaviness of this discussion. Unfortunately, uh, I feel like we have completely run out of time. It's now past um, 12.30. There are very important questions I had. Uh, there are few issues we have not tackled, for example. I had wanted to discuss about how um, media has affected some of our gender norms and how, how we need to unlearn and how we need to hold them accountable for the messages that they portray and how those influence our younger children as they grow into the different uh, levels of, you know, being an adult in, or rather being a human being in this in this world. And so what I will do, because I'm a cheeky person, is that I will still give people one minute to make their contribution, it's like a final statement. And Rachel, this is to you, one minute, one. One minute, one minute because also I'm, I'm, I'm also running out of time. Yeah. We need to go to another meeting. And so my question. So I uh -huh, think um, if you're clear, go ahead. Okay, Wait, just go choose. ahead. Mm -hmm. I think also media has a very important role to play in terms of um, um, in terms of pushing the gender agenda of gender justice. And this will go particularly with the kind of also news they bring in when it comes to the roles. Like, for example, I've been seeing in Kenya, where if a woman politician is found into a, into a corruption scandal, it's usually amplified. But when a male counterpart is found in a corruption scandal, it's not a big thing. So I think uh, the media needs to be having these sessions, even programs that are more gender justice. And uh, also to put it clear, uh, it's very unfortunate, Nyawera, it was Nyawera, she pulled up. But I was very clear when we need to look also to look in terms of people who, identify, who don't identify as either men or women and uh, how it affects them. Like, for example, why is it okay for a man to cut call a woman, but if another man cut call them, they get annoyed? Yeah. Why does it happen that way? So you can see the power thing dynamic, but also looking into the fact that also we need to know also LGBTQ folks exist and why it's important to put them in this kind of conversation of gender justice. And uh, feminism exists, black African feminism exists. And the way I said, women are not homogeneous. As long as you have information, and if you want information, Google, there's Google, or look for it. Uh, Kenya, there's right to information. I know also there's that thing of also like it's not accessible to everybody, which also we are pushing as activists to be accessible, but also should not burden young women and, and African women, the burden of gender. It has to be a collective work. All of us can, can do it. And uh, being that it's 16 days of activism, though for me 16 days of activism is every day, not November to December, um, let's ensure like uh, we center all this conversation and try to change from an individual perspective, from where I sit as my colleague, what do I do that contribute to the gender justice struggles? And uh, how do you center the discussion within the space of also even women living with disability? So I don't talk so much. Thank you for the, pla the platform, for the opportunity, for sharpening contradiction uh, discussion. Uh, we agree to disagree, but um, let's push the struggle forward for gender equality. Yeah. And it's true that no, not all women are pro-women, but it's because of patriarchy. Not that women, we are not supportive. Women, we support each other and we love each other. But patriarchy try to find its way to sort of uh, ensure they bring this narrative that doesn't exist. Because also, also I know so there are men that are not. They don't support men, but they don't say it. But when it comes to women, they bring it as if atutambuani tutambuana. Thank you so much for that. And finally, I will uh, invite patients to really give us her final words around anything you uh, anything around what we haven't covered, media's role, and and what you'd like to see moving forward. Just your final thoughts as we 
bring this conversation to a close. Dr. Patience. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I would say to start with, I would say uh, like um, saying, uh, commenting a little bit on what Richard said, uh, feminism didn't come for superiority, if I may say. It came for, you know, to harmonize equality. So it's just that different people have different op opinions and how different people do it. It also contributes because everything we do besides even feminism, it, how we do it, how we structure what we do, it also gives different messages. So coming back to the media and the future of young people today, uh, media, the era we are in, it's, it's uh, it's a technological era, if I may say. Everyone is uh, access media, and most of the information is you know is passed on media, and um, anything that comes out today, or you know, you say something today, in a few minutes you find it somewhere else in a different country, in a different continent. So definitely, and also these media houses could play a big role. So one of the things, and and I would say as well, the young people today they're mm -hmm. always on social media, everything mm -hmm. that goes on there, you know, you find them more updated than the, 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 the old people. So it also comes to uh, engaging them, uh, whatever we do, we don't, we don't have to leave them out because they're the ones to going, who, has going, who are going to spread that message, all that information. So one of the things that I would say that we are trying to do, it's training the media houses, people from media uh, who give out all those messages. And as well as it also comes to different people, if I may say on Twitter, an individual can, um, who has many followers, if I may say, can write something and that, that very thing is going to you know, go everywhere. So it also has to look, we have also have to look at those people, focal people who are, I would say media influencers or who are called influencers to as well have to change their mindset concerning this gender stereotype so that whatever message they're going to spread out there, it's going to be a positive message. So I would say, as I'm concluding, I would say thank you so much for this opportunity. And I, I hope that uh, however much we're having different mindsets, we're going to join hands together and fight for this until we get the, the equality and as well as equity. Thank you so much, Michelle and everyone here. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your final views. I couldn't agree more. Truly, we are a melting pot of different experiences, different, we come from different points of information, different points of enlightenment, and we are all working together for the same things. It just comes off differently. And so we are all lovers and friends here. I will, as moderator and as a feminist as well, add my voice to this by saying, Men should be lucky that women want equality, not revenge. I will go on to now. Exactly, Michelle. <laughs> That's so true. I will now move very quickly and thank everybody who was here. I'd like to now go through our panelists one last time before we close. Uh, thank you, Hilawit Warko, who is a gender youth and social transformation advisor at Care International Ethiopia. Thank you for making the time. Thank you, Kabelo Chabalala, who is the chairperson and founder of the Younger, or oh, sorry, Young Men Movement in South Africa. Thank you for making the time. I'd also like to send my great thanks to Dr. Patience Iribagiza, the executive director of Afro Arc, a Rwandese representative. Thank you for making the time. Nyawera Mushiri, who I still feel cheated out of because she did not finish her thought process. A singer, songwriter, and music producer, thank you for trying and trying and trying to stay on this call, but we understand that technical challenges happen uh, at different, technology will let you down when you least expect it. Huh? Then I'd like to reach out, I'd also like to thank uh, Rachel Mikali, as you know, our leader, of, uh, she's a leader of Coalition for Grassroots Human Rights Defenders. Thank you so much for your contributions and your boldness in your sharing today, your honesty in sharing today. And finally, I'd like to thank Robert Burale, who is an image consultant, a motivational speaker and market strategist, who really added his amazing thoughts and contributions to, and experiences even to the, to the discussion we had today. Thank you all for making the time. Before we go, I also like to remind you that this conversation is sponsored and coordinated by Henrich Paul Stiftung, also known as HBS, as well as Anika Initiative and Peace Tree Network. 
kindly remember to have this engagement as we go offline. Remember to follow the to tweet, rather to follow their social media pages, tweet, comment, subscribe, and share this ongoing conversation. The main hashtag for today is gaining, sorry, gaining grip experience three. But you can also use hashtag orange the world because we are in our second day of the 16 days of activism. This again has been very, it has been my delight to share this with you all. I really like what I have heard, what I have seen. I like what people have contributed even from the comment section. And for all of you who are wondering how to plug your voice, read more, each one, teach one. My name is Michelle Wanjiro. You will see more of me in the future. It has been my joy and pleasure to be your moderator. I will now hand over to our main moderator, Omeka from Anika Initiative. Robin? Thank you so much, Michelle. We can all agree that Michelle has done an amazing job and we are leaving this discussion having understood a great deal of information and issues surrounding gender and how they are stereotyped in our society today. Of course, as she has said, this conversation is currently ongoing. We will still be having a concert in the evening. For those of you who are wondering where you will get to hear uh, Nyawera, Nyawera's sentiments, she will be there performing live from Power, rooftop that's going of course it's going to be on youtube and facebook on all these pages please join in with the hashtag gaming grip experience 3 this concert will start at 6 p.m 6 p.m kenyan time so for my friends in rwanda that is 5 p.m rwandan time for my friends in south africa that's 5 p.m south african time for my friends in ethiopia that's 6 p.m as well so thank you so much for joining us but as always we have to love you and leave you from myself here at anika from michelle from rachel from patience it has been well and we hope that you're keeping safe warm sanitized and social distanced as we will be for today's concert at 6 p.m see you then bye bye, -bye. Mm -hmm.